So now we'll be discussing issue number three. This is about whether or not Pennsylvania physicians should have the option to prescribe medical marijuana. Team A will be taking the pro position or in support. Team B will be taking the con or opposition position. Once again, we'll be beginning with our opening statements. Uh, team A, we'll let you go ahead and start first. I'm going to come up here. Hello, everybody. My name is John, and this is Garrison. We're from Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, and we are pro for medical marijuana prescription. Uh, California was the first state in 1996 to legalize medical marijuana prescription. And since then, 31 states, including Washington, D.C., have also legalized medical marijuana, and for good reasons. Our approach for this argument revolves around the four principles of bioethics, which have been grounded in medical education and knowledge, autonomy, benevolence, non-maleficence, and justice. In regards to benevolence, as physicians and future physicians, our goal is to provide patients with the best possible treatments and health outcomes. There have been numerous studies over the past decade that have shown medical marijuana to be, to be able to reduce neuro, uh, neuropathic pain in multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and cancer. Additionally, it can be used to treat pain symptoms of Parkinson's disease, post-traumatic stress disorder, epilepsy, depression, and it has well-tolerated adverse profiles. If there's a potential to provide patients with a better treatment that's better than current uh, pharmaceutical medications, we should be steadfast with providing physicians open doors to prescribe patients with medical marijuana. Second point, non-maleficence, do no harm. The United States is notorious for consuming the majority of drugs in the entire world. The US is 4% of our global population, but we account for 45% of drug spending in the world, as well 27% of drug-related overdose overdose deaths in the world. Medical marijuana brings the potential to free many patients from narcotics, antidepressants, and other debilitating pharmaceutical drugs that have shown to create dependency and addiction, which plagues our country at the moment. Lastly, autonomy. If, we're, if any of us are to fall ill, we should all have the right to choose the treatment that allows us to live the life that we desire. Medical marijuana is a great replacement for many pharmaceutical treatments that comes without many of the negative component, components of chronic drug use. This ultimately improves overall life satisfaction. If physicians can prescribe medical marijuana, we can better treat chronic illnesses, decrease the burden of pharmaceutical drug abuse, and empower patients to be in control of their lives and not be controlled by the drugs that they need to treat their illnesses. Thank you. Team B, you have two minutes. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Anton, this is also John. We're from Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. And today we're gonna argue that the physicians should not be able to prescribe medical marijuana as a treatment to the patients at this moment uh, for three simple reasons. First of all, medical mar marijuana is considered to be a Schedule One drug. Uh, it is also has, the research around this area has been very sparse and the studies that Team A has mentioned has not been widely replicated. And the standardization of delivery method for medical marijuana as a treatment has not been uh, decided upon. And lastly, the patient safety is always something that we as future physicians and as current physicians should consider. Uh, if, uh, federal government classifies Schedule I uh, medical marijuana as a Schedule I drug, which uh, has, according to the definition, has no current acceptable medical treatment but in high potential for abuse. According to a paper published in the American Journal of Psychiatric, uh, Psychiatry in 2017, cannabis does appear to increase the risk of developing an opioid use disorder, which is something that we're currently trying to deal with. Secondly, research around this area, although has been conducted, is not widely replicated yet. According to the American Academy of Neurology, uh, there are a lot of probable benefits. But as, as I said again, they have not been widely replicated. And the American Academy of Neurology also states that the risk of serious adverse psychopathologic effects is nearly 1%, and the comparative effectiveness of medical marijuana versus other non-controversial treatments is unknown and unstudied. Lastly, I want to talk about the standardization of delivery method. As of right now, there's three different ways to administer Ten that. seconds. And the delivery, uh, the, um, the method of administration uh, can impact the onset intensity, effects on organ systems, and addictive potential. So something to consider. Thank you, Team again. B. Thank you. 
Well, it's fitting that's where you left off, because that was the question I had for team A. When we talk about pharmaceuticals and the way they're developed, there's a clear criteria by which they pass through clinical trials. But there's also post-market surveillance to see what comes out that we didn't catch beforehand. We understand that there's a standardization of dose, also a delivery method, like that was just mentioned by team B. And additionally, these are being produced by pharmaceutical companies that have been around for generations, producing these drugs in highly controlled chemical laboratories. My fear with medical marijuana and its ability to be prescribed is a lack of standardization, both in its dosage, its delivery route, and also the ways in which we monitor it once it's released. And additionally, this is coming from companies that are just being made in the last few years. With all that said, don't you feel like it's too soon in the game to be giving physicians the opportunity to prescribe that? We could really be introducing some liability harms to our providers. Well, I think that uh, the, what you mentioned, pharmaceutical drug prescription, um, the pharmaceutical companies have been around for a while, but I think it's very corrupt what they're doing. Uh, they do a lot of lobbying to pass their drugs. Um, and to answer your question, uh, the fear of not being able to have a real control over uh, medical marijuana. I partly agree, you know, a lot of work needs to be done, but I think it begins with opening the doors to, be, to prescribing it. Currently it's a Schedule One drug, and that's why it can't be prescribed. But if you can, we change the scheduling and we allow prescription, uh, physicians have a, a, an amazing power, you know, say at a public town hall meeting. And what they can do to educate patients, we can be facilitators of new programs to, to allow, to facilitate our understanding and to begin to uh, create programs that allows us to understand long-term, short-term effects of marijuana. So right now, you're, I, I partly agree, it's, it's something seconds. that's you know, to be concerned, but uh, if we begin prescribing it, that's the first step, I think, to you know, begin opening the doors to, to allow the benefits of medical marijuana. Thank you. Now, Team B, I know you mentioned it's a Schedule One substance, and that's been the case for a while. But a lot of us also understand that's largely a political battle, not necessarily something rooted in evidence base. In fact, Dr. Sanjay Gupta famously reversed his position, now coming out in support of the use of medical marijuana, because he had taken for granted just how that classification came to be. Like many of us, he simply respected the process and assumed it was done correctly. However, once he realized there wasn't the evidence, evidence base behind that classification, he realized that the decision making on its use needed to come from clinicians, not politicians. Don't you feel, given all those considerations, it's important that we restore control over the prescribing powers to the physicians? Well, it is important, but um, I think that we do have to respect the process as it currently stands, and unfortunately, we can't, on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, try to change the law as it exists. I mean, we kind of have to go through the appropriate avenues. and do the process the way it was, the way it's written right now. We, can, we can't just decide for ourselves that we're going to change the schedule today. And just to add to my partner's uh, point, we understand that it is a Schedule One drug for a political reason. We understand that it has, it has potential benefits. But as my partner said, we need to start doing uh, studies, re experiments, research that proves that it is beneficial and then we can start prescribing it to the patient. Prescribing it to the patients right now with very limited understanding of what it actually does. 10 seconds. Would be catastrophic and potentially dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Team B. This time we'll allow each team to ask questions of the other. Team A, if you'd like to begin. So our first question is, if, has, if medical marijuana has the potential for so much benefit, then why wouldn't we evaluate it like any other drug? Why wouldn't we legalize medical marijuana and open up the doors to perform more research? I don't think we're arguing that we shouldn't. I think our stance is that right now, physicians should not be prescribing it because we haven't opened that door yet. Uh, on the flip side of that, do you think that the fact that medical marijuana is illegal and they're so stigmatized in so many parts of the country, do you think that plays a role in the fact that there's been so little research done on it? So we'll leave that as a rhetorical question for now. Uh, Team B, you have the opportunity to ask your first question. All right, so 
I can ask a question about about you. You mentioned stigma, right? Uh, do you think that there are no problems with, for example, uh, training law enforcement officials in recognizing whether or not a patient has been prescribed this versus they're just a recreational user or somebody who shouldn't be? And what sorts of steps do you think there should be taken to kind of prepare law enforcement officials for this coming change? Yeah, I really think it's a systems level change that we need. And not just prescri uh, physicians prescribing marijuana, but all levels uh, of authoritative, authoritative policy, uh, law enforcement. If we're going to start prescribing it, we need to understand that people, this is allowed and, and it shouldn't be stigmatized. We need to reduce the stigma. Um, there needs to be education. There needs to be educational programs for patients, physicians, law enforcement. Um, so I, I agree. It's a systems level change that needs to happen uh, in order for uh, prescribing medical marijuana to, to fully have a, a large impact. Any clarification? If you may, you may ask another question. Um, okay, uh, I guess this might be in, uh, similar to what we just asked, but if medical marijuana has very, it's been shown to have positive effects on patient outcomes and treatments, why is it not analyzed further to uh, prescribe? All right, so. Um I don't know why it hasn't, I mean, that's, but it hasn't been subjected to the regular FDA re review process yet because it's still federally illegal. So we need to be able to have it go through that process before we can start prescribing it. So I don't have an answer for why, but I do have an answer for it hasn't happened. And so if we are going to start prescribing it, it has to go through that review, just like every other pharmaceutical that we currently prescribe. Team B, any additional questions? Okay. Well, this time then to keep on schedule, I think we're going to go ahead and jump right into the audience Q&A component. So once again, please come up to the microphones. Uh, I'll call on your number. Please introduce yourself, state your question, and who you'd like to ask. So let's go ahead and start at mic number one. Um, Michael Baxter from Berks County. I think we all agree there's been a lot of politics, a lot of emotions in this issue which cloud it. And personally, I mean, if Pennsylvania wants to legalize marijuana, that's one thing. But when you put the term medical in front of marijuana, that becomes an issue for me as a physician. That sounds like it's an endorsement by the medical profession. This is going to be a question for uh, uh, our team A. Team a. But, uh, because I'm not aware that there's any truly randomized controlled trials of marijuana with hundreds, let alone thousands of patients, like every other new medication that comes out, don't you think this opens up a true Pandora's box for the medical profession and pharmaceuticals that we just endorse essentially a medicine, call it a medical prescription for mostly non-truly medical reasons that we don't have the evidence to really support it? Uh, thank you for your question. I would agree with you 100%, and you're absolutely right. There's not a single high-volume randomized controlled trial that shows that medical marijuana is beneficial. Uh, on the flip side of that, though, I would also say that there are thousands of studies that show that there is the potential for benefit, that there is in many different diseases, as my partner mentioned, though, that there is uh, the potential, though, for t treating many different types of illnesses, different types of pain. And in addition to that, I'd like to state, though, that physicians are still the gatekeeper, that we're still responsible for e being able to understand when it's indicated, whether it be a last-ditch effort or whether it be uh, as a first line as research comes further down the line. But I do think that legalizing it and Ten putting seconds. it in the hands of physicians may give them more opportunities. Microphone three. Hi, Arsh, uh, Penn State medical student. Currently in uh, Pennsylvania, law states that a for a physician to prescribe medical marijuana, they have to be registered with the Department of Health and take a four-hour training, correct? Which, like, effectively creates a barrier to prescribing medications and a lack of access to patients who aren't near any registered physicians. Do you think this is a necessary barrier 
for us to control the, the way we prescribe medical marijuana. And that's for mm -hmm. team A. Team A. Oh, just to clarify, you're asking, uh, is it good to have these programs to educate physicians on medical marijuana? And the mandatory registration with the Department of Health. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think all, everything's important. Um, just as our, our other question to ask her uh, asked, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty. We're opening up a Pandora's box. Um, but I think the first step with is, is uh, providing access, but also taking the right protocols to allow, uh, to promote education and to inform all of us about what we do know at the moment. So when problems do arise, and we, we, we know how to manage, we know how to be adaptable, and we're well aware of what we're getting ourselves into. Microphone one. Uh, Doug Wells from Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. Um, given that this is still um, federally a um, uh, uh, class drug, um, it kind of uh, prohibits the ability to do research um, on the efficacy of the drug. So this could take years and years and years until we get anything um, you know, that's, that's evidence-based. Should we wait that long for something that we know can be beneficial? So this is for team two. Should, you know, should, is there a reason to wait that long um, when we know something seems beneficial? Just really quick, I want to interject. This is unfortunately going to be the last audience question. We are obviously running into a time barrier. So once again, please, if you have other questions you can get a chance to ask, come talk to us afterward. Okay. So. Um yeah, the, the process is going to take a really long time to get it, the drug rescheduled. That's, that's clear. But um, we're scientists. We're not um, just throw something at it and see what happens. So I think that if we're going to start prescribing this, we really do need to have solid evidence behind it. We can't, I mean, the first step shouldn't be access per se. The first step should be knowing what we're doing before we give somebody access to it. We need to know what we're going to put in the hands of our patients before we just hand it to them. We've seen um, this happen with the opioid problem right now. Uh, physicians weren't 100% aware of what they were handing out to their patients before they started prescribing it, and now we have this problem on our hands. I wouldn't want to run into the same thing. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll have the closing statements. Team B. So um, similar to what my colleague in the previous debate had said, uh, this, this for us comes down to ideals versus reality. Uh, very similar to what I was just saying, um, it's, it's great to want to provide something that we see s benefits happening for our patients in cases, in small studies, for certain conditions here and there, but at the end of the day, we are scientists. We are people who operate on evidence-based medicine. We don't have solid thousands of patients randomized trials done yet and we need to have those done before we can start handing out this kind of this kind of prescription to the people that we would like to help i mean we we can't be responsible for hurting them by accident that's just not that's not acceptable thank you very much team a your closing statements I think in closing, uh, we can agree that there was a lot that Team A and Team B agree on as far as the fact that this is a very gray area of research and that medical marijuana is not this necessarily wonder drug, though, as many touted to be. But I think that our position as Team A is that we would say that the benefits far outweigh the potential risks. In addition to that, we would say that medical marijuana, we believe, best fits the principles of medical ethics, as my colleague mentioned earlier. Beneficence. We have the potential to do better for our patients. Non-maleficence, we have the potential to reduce prescription opioid abuse and autonomy. We have the potential to empower our patients to be in control of their lives and in freedom of many controlling and extraordinarily dangerous drugs. Thank you, Team A. And once again, thank you to both teams participating. Can you please get one more round of applause for all those today contributing to these great discussions? <laughs>